Good morning, everyone. I'm Jason Elster, president of Downtown Madison, Inc., and welcome to another virtual What's Up Downtown Breakfast. We're glad you could join us today for an important conversation we're going to have on the economics of downtown, the economic power and importance of downtown, and moving ahead with the future. Today, we are uh, so excited to have several of our friends. We have Rob Gottschalk and Lupita Alvarez from Van de Waal and Associates and Diane Morgenthaler from Destination Madison here to talk about the economic power of downtown and future planning and the help that we're gonna need from all of you as we reimagine what downtown is going to look like. We originally planned to have Amy Supple from the Edgewater Hotel with us. Unfortunately, she could not make it last minute, but you're in competent hands. I'm gonna lead part of the presentation now. So I don't know if that's good or bad for you, uh, but I will be leading part of the presentation uh, as well. Before we hear from our panel, we want to uh, welcome several new members to Downtown Madison, Inc. We've got several new people coming in. We're excited to welcome two new groups here today that are with us and joining us here this morning. We have our friends at the Bayview Foundation, uh, Lexi London and the team, great, great team right in the center of downtown. Actually, we're going to hear from them in a few months about their incredible project on their campus just off of Regent Street and uh, West Washington Avenue. So please welcome the Bayview Foundation. We also welcome our new friends, Tiny Mighty and Matt Trammell, a great little marketing firm right here based in Madison. We're very excited to have Tiny Mighty, Matt Trammell in the team here today. So welcome to Bayview Foundation and um, Tiny Mighty to our membership. We've got a couple of announcements. There is a lot happening here in the DMI world. First, we have an important activity to many of our downtown businesses. A lot of the downtown businesses, particularly in tourism and hospitality, are looking for employees. And so we partnered with our friends at Madison Central Business Improvement District, Destination Madison, Madison Originals, and the Greater Madison Chamber of Commerce. And most importantly, our friends at the Workforce Development Board of South Central Wisconsin to put on an Isthmus job fair. That is tough to say, Isthmus job fair to help our employers find new employees. Uh, thanks to also the friends at the Job Center of Wisconsin. This is going to be virtual. We've got a great new platform. If you're interested in signing up as either an employer or an employee, a potential employee, I should say, please check out our website or the chat right now for more information. So again, thanks to our friends at the South uh, Workforce Development Board of South Central Wisconsin, the Job Center, and all of our partners on this important virtual job fair uh, coming up next week, June 2nd, from 2 to 4 p.m. We also have our next Nash at Noon on Monday, June 7th, from noon to 1. A conversation that follows very well on from our discussion today on the future of downtown arts, entertainment, and tourism with representatives from Big Top Sports and Entertainment, the Overture Center for the Arts, Destination Madison, and UCAN, the Urban Community Arts Network, and their project, the Greater Madison Music City. Very uh, great group of people to talk about what the future looks like in tourism and arts and entertainment downtown. So hope join us Monday, June 7th from one to, uh, excuse me, from noon, it's called the National Noon, it should be at noon, from noon to one o'clock. So please join us there. And last but certainly not least, we are excited to announce our first live event in almost 18 months when we return to the New Faces, New Places event outside on Thursday, June 10th from 4 to 6 p.m. at Bree Stevens Field. Thanks to our friends at Findorf and U.S. Bank and uh, Bree Stevens and Big Top Sports Entertainment and Forward Madison for putting on this event. It's going to be a great outdoor event. Please join us. Should see an email in the next day or two with more information. Can't wait to see you all. Can't wait to give you a fist bump. Whatever, whatever you want to do to be socially appropriately distanced, we're excited to see everybody at Breeze Stevens Field. Uh, details on this are all on our website and, and ready to go whenever you are to sign up. Should see an email from us in the next few days. Before we get jumping into the, the main program, I want to say a hello from our board of directors. We have our one of our co-chairs, Nathan Wadier, who is the DMI board co-chair and shareholder at Reinhardt Berner Van Duren. I'm gonna give a brief detailed board update. Good morning, Nathan, how are you today? Good, great, thank you, Jason, and good morning, DMI members. Today's program is both interesting and timely as we hear about the economic power of downtown. 
Before we do so, I'm pleased to announce that after months of vetting and input from the DMI standing committees, the DMI Board of Directors recently adopted an updated version of the DMI Civic Engagement Agenda. Thank you to all the DMI members that were involved in the process. This new agenda outlines DMI civic goals in the areas of economic development, equity and inclusiveness, quality of life, and transportation. It provides DMI a roadmap of how we plan to engage members and partners to effectively advocate for an active, economically strong, inclusive, and equitable downtown. We encourage each of you to review the DMI civic engagement agenda and get involved in a DMI committee of interest to you. An electronic version is linked in the chat and can also be viewed on the DMI website. We look forward to getting to work. With that, I'll hand it back to Jason to acknowledge today's sponsors. Thank you. Nathan, thank you very much. Thank you to you, the board, your co-chair, Megan Jarabic, for all your help. There were so many people, honestly, hundreds of people throughout the committee process, uh, the board, the executive committees, all the different committees at DMI that took part in the creation of this year's civic engagement agenda. We are very excited about this document uh, and can't wait to get it out to our full membership with the link here in the chat. So thank you, Nathan, very, very much. Continue to have thanks. We would not be here today if it wasn't for our sponsors who make this happen. Huge thank you to our friends, a major series sponsor, Whitley LLP, and our supporting series sponsor, Ho Chunk Gaming, Madison, Michael, Best, and Friedrich, the State Bank of Cross Plains, and our special contributors, the Edgewater Hotel, UW Health, Unity Point Health Meritor, and Quartz. So thank you to all. On behalf of the sponsors, we're going to hear a word from our good friend, Rob Kane, a partner at Whitley, to say everything that's happening in the world of Whitley. Hope you're doing well, Rob. How are you, my friend? Doing great. Thanks, Jason. And uh, good virtual morning to everybody. I look uh, really looking forward to a live greeting with many of you soon. It could be handshakes, fist bumps, uh, even bro hugs aren't out of the question at this point. So uh, looking forward to that live event, Jason. Uh, uh, Rob Kane, tax partner with Whipley here in Madison, uh, part of our manufacturing and distribution team, uh, longtime sponsor, and we're pleased to be a sponsor of DMI What's Up Downtown. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, as a professional services firm with audit, tax, and consulting capabilities, Whipley delivers customized services and solutions to help companies like yours navigate this uh, ever-changing environment that we live in. Uh, Whipley provides insight and advice and expertise for middle market organizations across a wide range of industries, uh, financial institutions, construction, manufacturing, real estate, nonprofits, and many more. Um, whether it's a audit to satisfy your banking or your shareholder needs, uh, tax advice like I give to help you optimize all these crazy new tax laws that keep coming at us or, or consulting to help your business prosper, what please the answer for all your value added needs. Uh, thanks for joining today's program. Make it a great day and uh, back to you, Jason. I love it, Rob. Absolutely make it a great day. And you help make it a great day by figuring out the tax code. So I do not do that. So thank you, because you guys help us out here at DMI. Thank you to Whipley again. Thank you to our friends at Ho-Chunk Gaming, Madison, Michael Best and Breeder, State Bank of Cross Plains, the Edgewater Hotel, UW Health, Unity Point Health, Meritor, and Quartz for all you guys continue to do. Can't wait to be back live here in the next few months with our What's Up Downtown breakfast. All right, we are going to get into our presentation today. Um, we've got three great panelists, uh, and then me, a mediocre panelist. So you, hopefully the three great panelists do a, a wonderful job. First, we have Rob Gottschalk, the Principal Urban Planner and Economic Strategist at Vandewall and Associates. His focus is on reimagining and leading implementation on large scale redevelopment efforts, as well as economic repositioning strategies for cities and regions. He and the team at Vandewall focus their efforts on communities in the Midwest and the Great Lakes region. Welcome. Rob, we also have Lapita Alvarez, an associate planner at Vanderwall & Associates, joining the firm in 2017. She manages redevelopment efforts in Muncie, Indiana, in addition to managing Next Muncie, a public-private partnership focused on advancing quality of place initiatives in Central City. Lapita led the data analysis for our presentation today. So thank you um, for all your help, Lupita, with this really important data on downtown uh, last but not least, we have our great friend, Diane Morgenthaler, my neighbor, uh, Executive Vice President of Destination Madison, who joined Destination Madison 11 years ago, leads the marketing team 
and has shifted her focus to organizational strategy, community engagement, and advocacy. Uh, she lives in the near west side, which I guess you already heard that since we're neighbors, and is passionate about Madison and community efforts. So welcome to Rob, Lupita, and Diane. We appreciate you being here this morning. This topic is really quite important. To set the topic up, though, I'm going to give a quick presentation on, on how we got to getting this information about the economic importance of downtown. Remember, though, we do have time for question and answer at the end for any of our panelists, including myself. So if you have a question, submit it through the Q&A function or through the chat. Either way works, and we, I will ask the questions of the panel at the end of the program uh, today. So think of your questions, see what you have, and we will answer any of those questions uh, for you. All right, so now, why are we here today? Why are we talking about the economic importance of downtown? As you know, everything changed about 18 months ago for downtown. Um, and why did it change? And, and what, what reasoning did it change? And what does the change see in the data? How important it is it that we reimagine a new downtown? That's why we're here this conversation today. But as a baseline, it's important to understand what creates and what makes a successful downtown, not just downtown Madison, but downtowns throughout the country. First, you need a strong residential base that supports those local businesses. And downtown Madison has that with just under 30,000 residents in downtown. You also have to have a large number of employees working downtown in a wide array of businesses. Madison also had that with downtown, over 50,000 employees in 2019 working downtown. You need a diverse set of events and activities happening at all hours of the day. You need reason for the residents that don't live downtown to come downtown, whether or not it's last night's game at Bree Stevens, whether or not it's the future farmer's market, which is coming in June. You need reasons to bring people downtown. And lastly, as Diane's gonna bring up, you need a healthy tourism economy attracting outside people from outside of our region to downtown. These things were all very vital and healthy before uh, COVID. Unfortunately, all of them changed significantly during COVID. And at that time, we thought we need to figure out a way to not just make sure we have a successful downtown we had before, but to reimagine the downtown into something that is welcoming, vibrant, and equitable for everyone in our community, some things that it has not always been. So a group got together in late 2020 to say, we need to create a public-private partnership, which we called the downtown group, to all work together to create that vibrant, equitable in downtown that's welcoming for everyone. As you can see, pre-2020, there were a lot of different groups working on the downtown area. But in 2020 and 2021, we knew we had to try something new. And we created this public-private partnership co-facilitated by our friends and the city of Madison and Matt Miklajewski to create a tighter relationships. What we did is we created three task forces in three important areas, equity, economic development, and activation and programming. And this group started to work very heavily in those three areas and started to ideate and brainstorm on both the short and long-term goals and solutions and ideas to actually reimagine what downtown can look like. And so from this work, we brought in the team, thanks to our friends at Madison Gas and Electric, mg &E, just wonderful, brought in Rob Gottschalk and Lupita to understand the importance economics and the economics of downtown Madison. And Rob and the team put together an excellent presentation and that's what we're going to hear from today. And at the end, we're going to talk about strategies that have come out from that presentation and out from this group that we want your help on today. So we're going to start now with our friends, Rob Gottschalk and Lapita Alvarez from Van Wallen Associates. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Lapita. How are you guys today? Morning. Good morning. All right. Well, welcome, you guys. The floor is yours. All right. Perfect. Well, thank you, Jason. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for the opportunity this morning to uh, share a bit of data on the impact of downtown and its importance on the economic health uh, of the community. Uh, Lupita and I are going to kind of tag team this a little bit, and we hope you find it as interesting as we did uh, to put together. So we have summarized uh, information from various sources as well as our own um, data. This is not a full-blown economic impact analysis of the downtown. Um, and, and a little bit as a heads up, um, I think it's important to understand that a good share of the data uh, or a portion of it that we present today is pre-COVID. So it's hard not to look at that data and wonder 
you know, how is it going to change? Uh, what are going to some of the long-term impacts going to be? And obviously, what can be done? So, um, Lupita, you can roll to the next slide. So you're going to see a variety of maps um, and data sets related to geographies. So that would be important just to get familiar with those uh, right off the bat. Um, so starting with the city of Madison, the boundary that we used for the future projections is really based upon the lands that will be in the city at 2040. So those are based on all inter jurisdictional agreements uh, that are in place because uh, we're using future projections. Zooming in, uh, you get to that red line that outlines about a quarter of the city uh, we call the central area, and that's roughly from Whitby Way to Aberg Avenue. Uh, panning them from there, the shaded pink area, the graded is what we call the greater downtown from Camp Randall uh, to the river. And then finally, the central downtown in yellow, which is delineated uh, as delineated by DMI. So the central downtown, um, that yellow area, is the area between the lakes, the university, um, and Cap East District, is only about 608 acres, or about 1% of the city's land area, yet it contains 10% of the tax base and the city's population. About 58% of that area is non-taxable. So that that 42 additional 42% of the tax um, taxable base is producing an awful lot. 21% of the jobs and 17% of the city's businesses lie within that yellow boundary. We have uh, dug into the tax base uh, a little bit more. So if you look at this, uh, those 608 acres that are in yellow totals over three billion in assessed value. So if, if you include the two shoulder areas of the greater downtown, which is in pink, it's over 5.2 billion or 18% of the city's 30 billion in assessed value. Downtown's value per acre is 10 times the city as a whole per acre value. So we also, you know, it's important to kind of look at how does this compare to other areas, you know, just for context, uh, other areas and other land uses really across the city. And if you kind of pan up to the right uh, on your scene, you see American Center or major, one of our major city office and job center. It's a, you know, roughly the same size, um, less than, um, you know, right around 400 million in assessed value. Take um, a major east or a major retail area like um, kind of the East Town area it includes you know all of the retail, including the East Town Mall. It's about a tenth of the value of downtown. If you swing all the way over to the left side of your screen um, on the west, that's over 2,000 acres of West Side development. It starts you know with the research park, includes the West Town Mall. You keep going out and up the belt line up to Sock Trail Office Park, all the way to the boundary of Middleton. And this whole area has a total value of about, oh, close to 1.9 billion. So about two thirds uh, of the total of downtown. I think we all know the desirability uh, of downtown and the isthmus has led to significant tax base growth <clears throat> and redevelopment over the past 10 years. Um, the $5 million assessed value per acre is at least five times the value of other, other areas um, within the city. And for a little, little context also, we took a look at how does this compare to other Midwestern cities? The city of Madison as a whole uh, as well as our central downtown, outperforms other cities when you look at value per acre. Surprisingly, it's almost equal to Milwaukee, Milwaukee's downtown in value per acre. Now, obviously, there's some nuances, there's some <clears throat> geographic boundaries to consider, but I think understanding the vertical scale of some of these other communities, it's, it's pretty impressive. Um, I think it does 
reaffirm the desirability of our downtown from a market perspective. Uh, Non-residential non tax base, uh, very important to communities as it provides revenue for property taxes um, with, with uh, these employment areas, typically requiring less services um, than say residential neighborhoods. The percentage of commercial tax base in central downtown is about 10% higher uh, than the city as a whole. The downtown contains about 15% uh, of the city's total commercial tax base. All right, so I will take it over from here and uh, thank you to Jason and DMI for having us come share some of this um, data that we gathered um, with you guys today. So Rob talked a little bit about tax base and it was important to understand um, where it comes from, but you know, we really thought it was important to take a look at where it goes. Um, so we just uh, took a look at, you know, for every dollar uh, paid in property taxes, how is it used? And you can see here that, you know, about 45 cents of that dollar goes to the school district. But if we look at this side, about 38 cents of every dollar goes to support the city and its wide array of services that they provide. Um, so if you just dig a little more into those 38 cents um, of every dollar, um, it's what makes up about three-fourths of the city's uh, general fund, uh, so you can see here in this pie chart. So that 10% of taxes paid by downtown, you know, plays a really important role in supporting all sorts of government functions. And just a couple of examples here, um, the approximate 25 million of taxes collected from downtown um, is equivalent to covering the city's portion of the planning and development budget or almost half of the $60 million fire department budget. So overall, you can see that this really small percentage of land um, generates a really big impact for the city and services that we uh, just can't overlook. So we also took a look at tourism impacts to downtown, which uh, Diane will share a little more about, but as you all know, downtown is our biggest tourism destination. Um, spending by visitors was estimated at a little over 300 million in 2019. And those dollars really tend to be recirculated several times in the community. Um, the biggest spending, as you can see here, was on food and beverage, lodging and retail, um, helping support over 4,000 local jobs that are generated by that visitor activity. So it's hard not to um, mention that when you're thinking about today, those COVID impacts really took away that flow of visitors from our downtown, which severely impacted those downtown sectors. Um, its impact has been significant with visitor spending falling by 190 million in 2020. This is down by 62% from that 2019 figure. So it's pretty significant. Um, with lodging taking the hardest hit, uh, which is important to keep in mind for this next slide. So visitors to downtown also contribute more than 25% of the city's room tax revenue, um, which was estimated at nearly 19 million in 2019. So the people coming to visit and stay downtown, you know, they help fund many of the things we, we enjoy such as uh, in community amenities, such as Monona Terrace, Ulbricht Gardens, um, Overture Center, um, but as I mentioned earlier, lodging was uh, hardest hit with room tax revenue for the city estimated at around 9.4 million in 2020. So this is about a 50% reduction from 2019. So this really has a ripple effect to our community's quality of place amenities that we just don't necessarily associate with a number of hotel rooms. Let's see, so just shifting gears a bit, um, another piece of analysis that we took a look at um, was just the Central Business Improvement District. So that district um, is this great area in the map. So it goes from the state of Foot Street, goes around the square. And as you guys all know, it's a, a public-private partnership of property and business owners 
who willingly chose to tax themselves so they can help market the area. Um, and as you can see in 2020, over 60% of the 392 businesses in the bid um, were food, drink, and retail, with the vast majority um, being locally owned. And just taking a closer look at the parcels within the bid, um, the face blocks of the square, um, these here, are largely owned by four to five major property owners. Um, these owners uh, lease ground level space and retail and restaurants and service oriented businesses. Well, if you take a look at State Street, it's a much different picture with much smaller parcels um, with various uh, property owners along the street. And the, the impacts of loss of business in 2020 and probably coming into this year likely had a greater impact to State Street since that first floor space is uh, likely a higher percentage of revenue for these smaller buildings. Um, and many of these are owned by couples or families versus uh, the major developers and landlords on the square that generate most of the revenues from um, the first floor spaces. Sorry, from the uses above the first floor spaces. So um, now that we've looked at the significant tax base generator that downtown is, um, we thought it was important to understand who lives here before we jump into future development projections that Rob is going to be sharing a little more on. So if you take a look at who lives here from an age standpoint, the greater downtown population is significantly younger than the city as a whole, um, primarily because of UW's presence and proximity. And this population, however, does heavily support our local uh, downtown businesses and many rely on this population to survive. Um, but, you know, interestingly, the, over the past 10 years, the greater downtown added more than 2,000 residents um, within the ages of 25 to 34. So while the city as a whole uh, saw a loss of 992 residents within the same age cohort, um, so it clearly speaks to more desirability for this uh, younger population to be living in the downtown. Um, and it's also probably a result of just developments in the Cap East and other areas which saw a shift away from that student-oriented housing we have seen in the past years. Um, and again, just many younger residents want to live downtown, myself included. I, the time I lived in Madison, I chose to live in that greater downtown area for that entire time. And then just looking at who lives here from a diversity perspective, the city of Madison has historically been more diverse than the greater downtown. Um, however, if you take a look at this uh, comparison of 2010 to 2020, um, you see that both Greater Downtown and the City of Madison are becoming more diverse. Um, let's see, and then just looking at the change in numbers here on this side of the screen, um, in between 2010 and 2020, you see that 42% of the projected 8,000 new residents added uh, to downtown were non-white with 64% of those uh, minority residents identifying as Asian. And then, um, so we imagine that these trends will likely continue um, given that our younger populations are more diverse and you know, with a proactive focus, we do see that the business mix will uh, respond to a more diverse marketplace in the future. So I will hand it over to Rob, who will share a little bit more on the development projections. Great, thank you. So with that snapshot, uh, socioeconomic snapshot, let's take a, a closer look at the potential future uh, impact of the downtown area. Over the last uh, several years, we've been working on behalf of the Madison Area School District in collaboration with the city, city staff, um, MG&E, as well um, to project the residential um, and employment related to development between 2020 and 2040. Um, this is a pretty pretty detailed analysis. I think we looked at over 2,500 parcels, both redevelopment and greenfield parcels in the in the Madison in Madison. Um, 
And these projections were completed prior to the pandemic, so we can expect some of the timeframes because we put development in five-year uh, timeframes. I think some of those are going to be adjusted some faster, uh, obviously, and some slower. So let's uh, let's take a look at the greater downtown area. So if you recall, that's the area between um, basically Camp Randall and the river. So nearly 60% of this area uh, shown in purple is non-taxable. So, you know, that includes obviously parks and government facilities, utilities, um, the university. And then on top of that, a significant amount of the area is also lower density residential area in neighbors, neighborhoods that we classify really as unlikely to change significantly. A significant number of parcels are also unlikely uh, to change because they've already had recent uh, redevelopment or they have significant improved value on the parcel itself. So areas, um, you know, like in the Capital East District, you can see uh, where the Constellation, the Galaxy Spark area uh, is shown in black, or if you go look at the face blocks um, of the square, or uh, as you get closer to the university where a lot of the newer, um, more student-oriented housing has been uh, developed, all areas that likely not gonna see a lot of those parcels change anytime soon. We also thought it was important to look at the city's local and national historic districts. Um, so given these historic designations, we don't expect areas within those districts to significantly uh, change either. So when you start to look at all of these layers together, uh, under look at the white space that it leaves, there's relatively few remaining parcels to accommodate new development and tax base growth. So now as we move into the projections from 2020 to 2040, um, you see on the map here, um, future residential development parcels are shown um, in yellow and more employment uh, related or predominantly employment are shown in red. You tally this up uh, in the greater downtown could see an additional uh, 11,000 jobs and about 11,000 residents by 2040 and potentially add an additional 2.1 billion in tax base. As we move um, a little bit closer in uh, to the central downtown, about twice as many residents are projected um, than jobs in that time period. We pan out a little bit. Uh, downtown's health, in our opinion, impacts a much larger geography, I think, as we all know. In the area we define as the central area, it's that thick red line that you see. Um, you can see that the vast majority of this area will not see significant change. The purple area, it's about 85% of that land mass. Um, so when you look at the clusters of redevelopment sites, uh, you know, kind of the red, and yellow areas, you see that they're really stemming out of downtown as well. So if you can go out the, the East Wash Corridor up towards uh, the Oscar area, um, you look at uh, the Regent Street Corridor, the Park Street Corridor, John Nolan Drive, all these main spines all emanating, you know, from the downtown or will also um, see uh, additional development over time. So based upon the redevelopment projections, when you really add it all up, you can see that the estimated tax base for the central area and particularly the greater downtown is significant. And to be conservative, um, we actually reduced our original commercial and office projections by 25% uh, due to uncertain, really the uncertainty uh, in the office workforce shifts and development lags uh, that may come during this time period as a result of the pandemic. Um, 
But even with this reducer, you can see that much of the new tax base um, will continue to come from the central downtown and the adjacent corridors. So then as we kind of look, you know, scale out one more level, uh, we look across the entire city, uh, we see that the central area is shown in red is critical uh, to our growth. If things continue as they have and downtown stays strong, we could see 45% uh, of the city's new jobs and about a third of the residents grow in the central part of the city in this 20 year window. So based on our estimates, um, this could result in the central area continuing to be the largest revenue generator for, almost, for, for the next 20 years. So I think, you know, we all knew the downtown obviously has, has a fiscal impact, um, but I think, but many people are unaware of just how significant of an impact it has on the city of Madison. Um, but we also all know that it's much more than that. You know, it's truly a bellwether uh, on our economic health and our vibrancy. Um, it is kind of the signature, you know, the isthmus and the downtown is the signature of our community's personality. Um, it drives significant amount of tourism. It is a place where we all gather. It's a talent magnet that really helps um, our homegrown businesses flourish. So we've covered uh, a lot of information uh, here. And so we thought we'd, you know, there's also a few takeaways if you kind of summarize all this information down. And we, there's kind of two big, there's two buckets. One is really directly from the analysis and then a couple that relate not only from you know, kind of combining the analysis and the deep discussions that we've been having uh, within the task force. So, you know, on, on the first one, I think it's just important to, to recognize that, you know, over the last 25, you know, especially the last 25 years, the enormous amount of efforts that have been going on by so many groups, DMI and city and the public and private investments, um, has really had a significant impact uh, on our community and some significant tax base uh, impact on our community. And, it, and to, this, to this point, at this point, um, the tax base helps carry a higher share of city revenues. But I think you also see then we, when we're looking at kind of where, where to from here, that you know, we obviously all know we have a fixed geography um, and development in the downtown area. Um, you know, there's not an enormous number of sites. So getting those projects right is really critical. So to optimize that potential um, for our long-term, you know, financial and environmental sustainability and getting those things, um, making sure those future projects really meet the evolving demographics uh, that Lupita was describing uh, of the city is absolutely critical as well. And I think um, we also, uh, it's clear that the success of what's happened downtown, it just didn't happen by accident. You know, um, there's so many proactive and intentional and methodic and uh, things that got us to this place, obviously market dynamics as well, and the, and the broader economy within the region um, helped spur those growth. Um, but I think along with all those proactive steps that have been taken, it's, it's a similar moment in time that we have to have that same intentionality and intentional focus on creating a more equitable and accessible uh, downtown for everyone and that, that opens those economic opportunities for for all, and it's also much more welcoming, welcoming to all. Our, our city is, is, rap, is rapidly growing, um, and with that, you know, it's growing pains, it's maturing, um, and the future revenues of the central area as we grow um, can absolutely play a huge role in addressing the many needs that come with the growing city. So it'll help us address those challenges. It's gonna help us recover. 
and certainly build uh, more equitably and sustainably uh, over time. So I think that uh, for the most part sums, sums it up on behalf of Lapita and myself. Uh, thanks obviously for the opportunity to share, uh, share this work. It certainly was um, really interesting to put together and think uh, a bit more broadly about kind of the commute cumulative impacts uh, of the downtown and, and, and its impacts on our broader community. Thank you. Rob and Lupita, thank you very much for that important and insightful information. We're now gonna get an update from our friends at Destination Madison and Executive Vice President uh, Diane Morgenthal. But remember, we do have time for question and answer after Diane and myself are done. Uh, so please submit your questions to either the Q&A or the chat, and we will be able to get those questions uh, answered for you right away. Diane, good morning. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me join the panel today and uh, be part of this conversation about the future of our downtown. What I want to share this morning are just a couple of points of reference as it relates to how the tourism industry has fared in 2020 and what we're digging out of, if you will. Lupita and Rob both talked about the importance of tourism as an economic driver in our community and specifically in downtown. So understanding where we're coming from and where we're headed is one of the things we wanted to point out to the group today. So we're gonna just share a couple of pieces of info. First in uh, 2020, we as an organization saw 97 different conventions and events cancel and not rebook. So that's just money lost in our community of $57 million, 110,000 plus room nights, and 170,000 visitors. This doesn't include World Dairy Expo or the WIA events or any of the football games that were also canceled last year. So the impact overall was really, really dramatic and significant. Um, we're hoping for better things this year. Hotel occupancy is one of the things that we look at as a bellwether for our industry. 2019 is the blue column. So you can see we have a very healthy occupancy during our uh, best seasons here in Madison. The orange is what happened in 2020 and the gray is 2021. So really you can see the first part of this year in 2021 uh, was struggling for our hotels. And I will say April overall in the market came in at just under 40% occupancy, but downtown, our core downtown hotels, one in four, less than one in four rooms were occupied. That's lots of people missing from downtown, uh, eating in our restaurants, visiting our retail stores, uh, doing, uh, seeing things that they, and doing things in downtown. So very, very critical difference when you look at the market as a whole, versus that core downtown, and we monitor this really closely. These are some uh, national numbers that I wanted to share because we are looking at what's next and when will we recover. So the first is some insight on hotel forecast. At the bottom, there are three graphs. One talks about room demand, and you can see that the expectation is that hotel rooms demand will be at 2019 levels but not until 2023. More important is the far right graph, which is the revenue per available room. And this is really about the health of the hotel business, the profitability, the sustainability of those businesses. And in that case, we're really not looking at getting back to full health until beyond 2023. So this is the trough our hotel businesses are coming through as we, as we move through uh, the economy going forward. Lots of lead time here. The last thing I wanted to share, and it's really this uh, domestic travel expenditures graph on the lower, um, lower left-hand side of your screen. What it shows is that uh, leisure travel will begin to rebound more quickly than business and convention and event travel. That's great for Wisconsin as a whole because we attract a lot of leisure travelers, but for Madison, that business recovery is critical. That's our bread and butter for our businesses and for our downtown. And that is likely to take until 2025 to get back to 2019 levels. So we have a long road ahead of us. We have a very active and proactive sales team working on booking conventions and events for the future, but it's beyond just the convention and events. It's also about regaining 
confidence in business travel and bringing those business travelers back who do business with our government, with our university, and with our major corporations here in town. So all very critical to our recovery from a travel perspective. And I think we're turning it back to Jason at this point. Jason, to give us the wrap up. Exactly. So thank you to Rob and Lapita again for the very important economic information about downtown and then a, a sobering update from Diane about the tourism industry, particularly in downtown, right? $303 million economic impact in 2019, all the way to about $120 million in 2020. So a lot of work ahead of us, right? And this sort of frames the picture of how do we move forward as an organization, DMI, how do we move forward as organizations downtown and how do we as a community move forward. So as we discussed at the beginning of the presentation, we knew there needed to be a, a different model. How, how are we going to reimagine downtown again to make it an equitable, vibrant, and welcoming place for everyone? How do these different groups, public and private, all work together to make that happen? So you see that, again, that graph in, in pre-2020, all of us are working together loosely, but because of this downtown group in 2020 and 2021, about six months ago, we really started to work much more closely together. We looked at different analysis. We did future scenario planning. We used the information that Rob and Lupita came up with to help come up with outcomes and what we wanted to see, right? And we took all of that, funneled it together, created the vision, which we've said is creating an equitable and vibrant downtown where everyone is welcome. And we created six strategies to help get this work done. And this is what we are excited to announce today, these strategies that we are starting to get out into the community, to get the entire community to look at them, to analyze and to understand them, and to start to implement these important strategies. All this work will then be led by the downtown group with the different task forces in, in each one of the strategy areas. So the six strategies that the group has identified and the community is starting to go over are very important. And, and number one, and the one that sort of runs the main vein throughout all of this work is equity and diversity representation in business, in events, in housing, and in workforce. This is the, the, the bedrock of all of the work of each of these groups, but in particular, this strategy on its own. We also need to be looking at demand generators, right? As we began this presentation, we talked about what makes a successful downtown and it's residents, it's office workers in diverse areas, it's diverse events happening and it's strong tourism. We just talked about how important when downtown is up and running that can be, but Diane gave that great story and sad story about what happens when it's not. And so we need to make sure we bring back those demand generators. So strategies in tourism, right? That commercial office space, the question that many of, our, many of us are asking, what's going to happen with the commercial office space? The resident base, which we have seen very positive move forward. We think there's about 1,500 to 2,000 apartment units, either in construction or in the entitlement phase downtown. And then programming. How do our friends, our great friends at the Madison Central Business Improvement District and many other organizations program downtown to bring events that people want to see, like the Farmer's Market, like Taste of Madison, like Concerts on the Square, coming back downtown. These demand generators are key. We need more foot traffic and just more people downtown for the whole sort of ethos, the whole being of downtown to work. We need to look at the evolution of State Street and public improvements, right? The Pet Mall, transportation, public park space, um, public space and public safety. All of these are big, big topics. And that conversation has completely switched. And you saw that with the great success of the Streetery program uh, downtown uh, and many other locations outside. We are looking at public space different. What is the evolution of that space? We have to pay key attention to State Street and Capitol Square retail anchors. What is happening with the first floor storefronts? Make sure we have a very active space, that third space that people want for the offices, but just that quality of life space we want for all of our residents and create different and unique and, and, and diverse businesses to come downtown that really pull at all of the souls of our entire community to say, I want to come downtown. I have ownership in downtown, and this is where I want to be with my free time. We have to look at that economic framework, just as Rob and Lupita talked about, to make sure we have a healthy and sustainable downtown. And last, we need a strategy to make sure how are all these groups working together? How is the community involved in this conversation? How do we communicate? How do we message? How do we build consensus building moving forward? So there is a lot of work to come, but we are asking all of you to take part in this work. And how can you do that? You can do that by coming downtown, eating, shopping, and having fun. You can come downtown by returning to business downtown, right? Come back to your office 
attend, bring your meetings downtown and bring your conventions downtown, attend downtown events. We had one last night with the Forward Madison game. We've got many things coming up over the next few weeks and support the downtown group in assisting in our strategies. If any of you want to participate in any one of those strategies in any one of those groups, please send us a note. The more people that are taking part in this work, the better it will be. All right, we've got a few minutes left for questions here today from our panel. So if you have questions, submit those through the question and, anal, uh, question and answer section of the bottom of your screen or through the chat function. Our first question today is a follow-up, Diane, about the importance of the business travel and convention travel downtown. I think many people thought, you know, this is an area where, where we get a lot of leisure travelers. Why is the convention and visit and convention and meetings business and business business so important to the success of downtown? Sure. Very key is that the business traveler is typically a weekday traveler. Conventions are typically Monday to Friday timeframe, whereas leisure is typically a weekend traveler. So for a hotel or a restaurant or any of our businesses downtown to really provide great service across all seven days of the week, they need that flow uh, in the, across the entire week. So it is a really critical base of business to build from. And particularly the business traveler, those are regular, um, regular travelers into our community for a variety of reasons. And they really do provide that, that sort of solid economic base for our businesses and our hoteliers. Uh, next question is for Rob and Lupita. How important is it to plan on the sort of the private side with the land use, right? I think you guys had uh, suggestions that we just don't have that much land to aggregate to, to, to make sure we have the growth in, in jobs and the growth in residential. How important is it that, that the groups are all working together to plan the best use for land downtown? Well, I think the city takes a, you know, a great pride in, in advancing you know, strong plans. And I think this is another, you know, moment as we look forward to um, kind of some new imagination about what downtown can be with those, you know, really key, key parcels, especially some of those, especially the transitional ones in between major areas, um, I think is going to be really key to how the central part of the downtown connects to the adjacent growing redevelopment corridors. So I think the planning for that and the implementation um, and having the right context for the development community that they are part of these pieces and linkages to, to build a stronger connection. And what are those nuggets that you put in there that help build the bigger critical mass, I think is really important uh, in this next phase because so much amazing development and projects have already you know been brought forth, it's kind of the foundation. So now it's the next pieces. Well, actually the next question sort of fits into that. A uh, couple of big projects, we've talked about the Lake Monona waterfront, very large project, how do you connect downtown and then connect uh, South Madison and all this work. Part of that is the Align Energy Center. Great question. What are opportunities exist with the Align Energy Center campus right next to downtown and the sort of gateway into downtown? I know Diane, Rob and Lupita, you all three are working on this project. Yeah, I can touch on that. Um, I do think it is an amazing opportunity, quite honestly, um, as the downtown does kind of continue to mature and, and reach capacity uh, to a certain extent over the next, you know, 20 years. The ability, you know, it, a lot of discussion has happened in the past about what could happen in that area, but we're really maturing to that level as a city now. And, you know, it's kind of a, a latent asset. Um, there's a, it's a great convention asset, but the area around it maybe hasn't, you know, there's been development, but has it really optimized? And I think now the potential for that whole area to be one of the great destinations in our community and knit completely and cohesively and seamlessly with the south side neighborhoods and the downtown is an enormous opportunity to kind of bind that whole thing uh, together and, and uh, add a whole nother layer of dimension to our, to our downtown. Huge, huge opportunity. And I, I would echo that, but I, I also think one of the things um, is this great opportunity to connect the lake to our Madison communities, that that part of our lake is underutilized. Um, how do we really make 
that park space really come alive and connected to our community. So as Rob said, they're just, there's many, many opportunities there. They're all very exciting and all very, um, as he said, we're, we're getting to the point now where we can envision it. And I think that's exciting for those of us that have been working on this. Yeah, I think Diane, you bring up a good point. Our, our good friends at the um, at, at, at Clean Lakes Alliance, they have a statistic that 48 or 49 percent of all of the, the five lakes, Lakeshore is owned by um, some sort of public entity, right? The county, the city, the state, the university. Uh, but yet it seems like many of us just have no access and not the best access to the water. And I think this could potentially be a really important project. All right, we've got time for one question. It's a biggie. But I would definitely want to hear your thoughts. Any thoughts on the impact of creating an entirely a pedestrian mall on State Street? Rob, Lupita, Diane, anyone want to take that question? Well, you know, I think from a from a tourism perspective, I think some sort of a pedestrian mall could be a big draw. But it requires it, it, it requires it to be visibly attractive. It requires it to be safe. It requires it to be programmed all of things we are capable of doing as a community. Um, but I think it would be a great draw for residents to come down downtown and as well as to attract people here from other communities. So um, it's an exciting proposition. It's a challenging proposition, but very exciting at the same time. Well, that is a great way to start big project, a big vision potentially for uh, our city. And I think that that's what we walk away from, most importantly, is that if, when we reimagine and as we reimagine downtown and be intentional about diversity, equity, inclusion, be intentional about what we're doing downtown, we have to think big. And thinking big means bringing our entire community into the conversation. Thinking big is about big projects like the Lake Monona Waterfront, like the Alliance Energy Center, like what happens with our public space. And these are all conversations we want and need you all to take part in. So if you're interested at all in working on any of these strategies, please send me a note. Any one of us are, are here to help to get you guys connected with this work. One of the things that has made me so excited about downtown and where we're moving is how many people have reached out and said they want to help with projects downtown and how many people care about downtown. So thank you. And thank you all for being here today. Rob, Lupita, Diane, you guys did a fantastic job talking about what's happening downtown right now in the future planning. We are so thankful for all the work that you guys have done. A huge shout out to all of you and another shout out to our friends at Madison Gas and Electric for all of their help uh, with this work too. We want to thank our sponsors for today's event. Again, we would not be here without you. Uh, thank you to Whipley LLP, Ho-Chunk Gaming, Madison, Michael Best and Friedrich, the State Bank of Cross Plains, the Edgewater Hotel, UW Health, Unity Point Health Meritor, and Quartz. We appreciate all of you for joining us today. Thank you for being here. I hope you guys have a wonderful long weekend. Enjoy your time off, but hopefully as part of that time off, we'll see you downtown. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all you do. We really appreciate the support. Talk to you later. Bye now.